Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 0363659 Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. Pray together. Father, we bless you tonight. We give you all the praise for bringing us back here. Thank you for granting us opportunity to look into your world. We're just asking for your mercy. We're asking that you will step forth your hand towards us and you will release your fullness to come to us. In the name of Jesus Christ. We are praying, O oh God, that the mystery of the cross will become plain in our individual hearts. And that Father, the crucial point where the cross ought to occupy in our relationship with you, may you reveal to us as we study tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. As we build on this message, we ask, Lord, that there will be understanding. There will be a definite revelation. And it will mix with faith within us. It will push us forward in our walk with you. For every heart that is here tonight with a particular need, we ask that that need be met this night in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. In Jesus Christ's name we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. We simply want to understand the cross and the Christian life. That's what we are going to be looking at. We want to deal with the cross, the implication of the cross on our Christian experience. That's what we are dealing with. This night particularly, we are going to look at the various symbols by which the, uh, the cross was represented in the scriptures and what is the definite implication of it for our lives. John chapter 3 from verse 9 to 16. Are you there? Eh? John chapter 3 verse 9. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, As thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things, verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life while you keep your hand on that let's turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians let's go quickly to 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 16 to 19. 
and I baptized also the household of Stephanas. Besides, I knew not whether I baptized any other, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words, I mean the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which believe, those of us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Please go to chapter 2, and we we'll read verse 6. How be it? We speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that are come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Let's stop there. May God bless His word to our spirits in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. When Nicodemus raised a question with the Lord Jesus, as we look at it in Matthew, I mean John chapter 3, he said, How can this things be? We had traced the fact that that question arose out of a matter that the Lord Jesus Christ raised as far as partaking and having a share in the kingdom of God. Jesus was telling Nicodemus that except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. For that which is born of the flesh is what? Is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Say, so marvel not that I said unto you, ye must be born again. And why the Lord Jesus Christ uh, was saying this with all firmness, with all finality, Nicodemus raised this question that has warranted our study even tonight. How shall these things be? And it was in response unto the matter of how a natural man can be transformed to become a spiritual man. How a man of the flesh can be made to become a man controlled, directed, imbibed, and imbued by the Holy Spirit. How a man who had lived all his life living for the desires of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, how he can become a spiritual man? That was the question Nicodemus was raising. How can these things be? And as a result of that question, the Lord began to speak about the mystery that we are going to be studying again tonight. I want us to look at that scripture in, in John chapter 3, very briefly, and then we return to the book of First Corinthians that we have read now, and maybe refer to another passage, all trying to establish the meaning, the divine consideration, for bringing in the cross. And what is the purpose of the cross as far as our Christian experience will be concerned? Now, let's return back to John chapter 3. Put your hand on your Corinthian passage. We will refer back to it eventually. John chapter 3. The Bible said, He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, in verse 11, we speak what we do know and testify what we have seen 
and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Before I press on to verse 14, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ, talking about the mystery of the cross, as we are going to discover it here, he says he's speaking what he knows. Hallelujah. He's speaking what he has seen. He's handling a wisdom that is heavenly. He said, if I have told you things of the earth and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? First and foremost tonight, I want you to come to understand that the matter of the cross is a divine mystery from heaven. What did I say? It's from heaven. It's an heavenly thing. The cross was not invented here on earth. The cross, even though it coincides, with several things that the Jews use in order to discipline an offender. But as we will study tonight, you will discover that it's a divine mystery that the heavenlies have been keeping in the matter of our deliverance. And when the Lord Jesus Christ began to speak about it, it looked very strange. When he began to introduce the subject of going to die on the cross of Calvary, it was a strange matter. In fact, the disciples could not understand. They said, no, 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 you will not die any death. Do you remember that? And when Peter said, Master, God forbid, you will not die any death. What did he say to, what did he say to Peter? He said, get thee behind me, Satan. For thou summarize the things that be of men and not the things of God. As if say, you do not understand. You sanction, you cherish human idea, you think as a mere man, you do not understand the things of God. So when we talk about the cross, we are talking of a divine mystery that God Himself had kept from the foundation of the world. And it is being made manifest even in our age. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, secondly, we notice that when we deal with the matter of the cross, it is not just an accident, it was planned, it was divinely arranged to accomplish a purpose for God. And largely, what I will be doing tonight is to identify together with you the various points at which God began to speak about the cross, what it is meant to accomplish. I know that by the time I'm ending, God will give us a point at which you can apply it to your own lives and deal with your own situation in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, Jesus Christ now began to first and foremost explain a divine strategy unto Nicodemus a strategy that will bring about our own deliverance. I would like us again to refer back to Moses as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. And that particular scripture, the story itself came up 
in the book of Numbers chapter 21. I want us to tell that story briefly again so that we can take off from there. Now, Numbers 21, the story is from verse 5 and it ends in verse 10. Now, what happened in the wilderness was that the children of Israel they fell into sin. <coughs> they disobeyed God. They murmured against God. And as a result of their murmuring, as a result of their breaking God's fence over their lives, as a result of entering into disobedience, the Bible said a fiery serpent was released into the midst of the congregation. And it was biting. And anybody that the serpent, you know, beat, what happened? They died. The Bible says much people died. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, you see, it is not the way they died or how they were healed that is our own case tonight. That's not what we are dealing with, actually. We are referring back to the book of Numbers Simply because the Lord Jesus said, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Hallelujah. And when he talked about being lifted up, we realized he was talking about just as Moses and the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man the Lord Jesus, be hanged upon a tree that whosoever shall believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. Now, it is that strategy that concerns us tonight. But in order for you to have a broad understanding, that's why we tell the story. Now, when the children of Israel broke God's edge over their lives, and I did say in the morning, that as long as a man is living in consonance with the will of God for his life, as long as you are living according to the will of God, as long as you are walking in obedience unto God, as long as you are living under the cloud of his presence, there is nothing the devil can do to override your life. Even though the, 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 the children of Israel, they were passing through the wilderness. They passed in the daytime. They passed in the night time. They traveled a dangerous period. But as long as God was with them, and as long as they were living in obedience, as long as there was no sin found in their midst, no serpent, no matter how terrible the wilderness was, could bite any of them. I have an assurance for you. If you are walking in consonance with the will of God for your life, if you are living in proper fellowship with the Lord, you don't need to fear. The Bible says, As mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about those that do what? That put their trust in Him, those that fear Him. But then the Bible said, Whosoever digget a pit shall fall into it. And whosoever breaketh an edge, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 8. The so whosoever breaketh an edge, what will happen? Serpent will bite him. Now, what's the meaning of this? It's as if there's an edge around every one of us. There is a fence God has built around every man who has repented, who has come into the uh, into the Lord Jesus Christ who has given his life to Christ and who has trusted in the ability of God to save and to deliver. There is a fence God has put around every one of us who have said bye bye to sin and bye bye to the world. And day and night he said, he that keepeth his strength shall neither slumber nor what? Nor sleep. But when they murmured against God when they broke their covenant with God, when they went into sin, he gave the serpent, he gave the devil an undue right, 
a liberty to break forth onto their lives. Brothers, let me say some few things on this before I go on. Do this is not the major issue I'm dealing with tonight, but you need to catch it. God's fence. God's fence. Are you hearing me? Is your defense. Sometimes when God gives you a commandment, it looks as if God has caged you. It looks as if you couldn't go anywhere you like. It looks as if God has edged you in. As if God has fenced your life. But you see, the fence God placed on your life, the restriction, so to say, that God placed upon your life, is your defense. It's your protection. It's your security. It is your rampart. A man that walks outside God's fence, who wants to live according to his will, who wants to live according to his self-pleasure, who wants to walk the way he likes to walk, who does not want to be controlled by the word of God, is a man outside fence. And is a man without a divine defense. Did you hear what I said? Now, when the children of Israel broke their relationship with God, the fence over their lives broke, and the defense over their lives also broke. So serpent was able to bite them. Just in passing, I must ask you, are you living within the fence of the word of God? Brother, are you walking within the circumference of God's will for your life? God's instruction to your life is actually your protection. It might look inhibiting. It might look as if you don't have all your liberty. But I want to tell you it's better to be tied down for God to be restricted by God than to be allowed to go as a free range. Serpent is walking everywhere by the, by the, behind the fence. For any man that breaks through the fence, that will break the edge, what is he waiting to do? He's waiting to bite. May he never bite in the name of Jesus. And so we notice that the fiery serpent began to bite the people. And the Bible said, much people die. Much people died. Much people were lost. Then the people began to cry. The people began to pray. The people began to seek the face of God. They came and begged Moses. They said, Moses, do what? Pray for us. Please go and plead with God on our behalf. Please go and talk to God. Go and tell the Lord that we are sorry. We have sinned against God and we have sinned against you. Plead with God that He will take away the serpent from us. To me, which was a very, very direct request. Is it not a direct request? Take away the serpent from us. Take away the serpent from our lives. We don't want the serpent again inviting us. Lord, please have mercy on us. And I imagine also that God had enough power to do what? To take away the serpent. You could have just given a word of command and say, Yes, O ye serpents, back to your holes. And what will have happened to all these snakes? They will have gone back. And the children of Israel will have been free again. But the Lord decided to introduce a strategy. Hallelujah. I know that so many of us you will really, really desire that God should take away the devil from this world so that you can be free. Is that not so? Some people say, look, why should the devil be, be allowed to be, to be tempting somebody, to be making somebody to fall down like this? 
If God really wants us to be holy, He should have taken the devil away and bind him. So sometimes I hear some of us when we pray, we pray very, very zealously but foolishly. Said you, Satan, Satan, I bind you. I cast you to the bottomless pit. Don't come out again. In the name of Jesus. You are joking. In fact, as soon as you finish praying, the devil will jump up and say, I'm around again. The truth is that you cannot bind him and cast him into the bottomless pit. The time for him to be bound for 1,000 years had not come. When that time comes, God himself will bind him. Amen? Amen. But what is the divine strategy? Despite the biting serpent, are you following me? Despite the biting serpent, what is the divine strategy for victory? What is God's wisdom to grant us victory despite the serpent that is biting? Are you with me tonight? God will help us as we go steadily tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. Now the Bible said... God told Moses, I will not drive away the serpent. Of course, the serpent will be there. I will not stop the serpent from biting. It will continue to bite. What brought serpent to bite you until it is dead with? It will continue to bite. But there's a strategy. It looks so unreasonable. It looks so unconnected. It looks so foolish. And the Bible said the preaching of the cross to those that perish. What is it, please? It's foolishness. But to those of us that are saved, it is the power of God. I'm praying that God will open your spirit. To see the power of God in the cross in the name of Jesus Christ. When you see it, you will join the man that composed that song, the old rugged cross. There, I cherish you. You wonder why a man will cherish the cross. Men that have had an insight and a revelation onto the mystery of the cross, they cannot but cherish it because it is the highest point. In our deliverance. It's a strategy that the devil did not understand. And if he had understood. First, Timo, uh, first Corinthians chapter 2 said. Are they known it? Are the princes of this world known? They will not have done what? They will not have crucified. The king of glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now listen. God was telling Moses instead of killing the serpent and I want you to listen there are various ways to deal with that snake it's either to carry a rod everywhere you go as you see the serpent what do you do? you continue to chase it around you continue to chase it around that would have been wonderful but I don't know how many people will survive it if we will wait until all serpents have been uh, slaughtered. It means we have to be running around. They say it's here right now. Ah, it has gone this way. Ah, please pick it. It has beaten me now. Ah, it has beaten my daughter. All of that. That's a way out. A way of chasing the serpent until we can kill it. But God didn't choose that method for us. He chose a different way. What was the way he chose? Moses, you will construct. And I want you to please be careful as we go through this point. It's a very critical point. Very critical before we can do the implication of it on our lives. Construct a serpent. Exactly like the one that is biting the people. But you make it of brass. 
And what do you do with the serpent that you have constructed? You will hang it on the tree. That whosoever, please take note of that whosoever, anybody at all that was beaten by the serpent on the ground, who dares to look? Now I want you to see the simplicity of this strategy. But the simplicity of the strategy of the cross is actually the stumbling block of the cross. Do you understand what I'm saying? The simplicity of that strategy is the difficulty of it. It is too simple for human beings to imagine. And even as we are sitting here now, Several of us, we have not experienced the power that the cross of Jesus can release. Because it looks so simple. It looks too simple to work out. The Bible said, anybody that has been wounded or beaten by the snake on the ground, let him not run around. Let him not band a bandage. Let him not hold his leg. Let him not chase the snake to kill. But let him do what? Let him look up. Look onto the snake on the tree. <laughs> Hallelujah. That whosoever looks down and looks at the snake that bites him and trying to pursue that snake because you know the normal thing when a snake bites you even when you get to the hospital what do they normally say did you kill it did you kill it can you bring it what would they do they want to see the kind of venom it is inside so that they can know the kind of anti-snake venom they are going to inject you with it was so crucial to kill it but Baba's wisdom is different. What was that his wisdom? Never pursue it. Never try to tie a bandage. Why do you normally tie bandage? So that it will not move up. So that we can block the transmission. But all of that cannot stop this theory serpent from killing. You may tie your bandage, you may cry to your father. Wives must have called their husband. Children must have called their mothers. Yet they will die. Only those that care to look up have to live. Praise the Lord. So just imagine what was going to happen now. It looks to me as if the, the tree on which the snake was hung must have been made so conspicuous on a very tall tree so that everybody that wants to look at it may do what? may be able to see it once a snake bites the next thing to do is not to look at the snake what is the next thing to do? you look up and as many as looked up they were delivered listen was the snake on the ground removed? eh? was it removed? alright so let me ask you how many times were the people supposed to look at the serpent on the tree? Eh? As many times as the snake bites. How long do you expect Moses to keep that brazen serpent on the tree? Eh? As long as the serpent on the ground is still there. Are, are you with me? So just imagine how it must appear. Even when you are not sure that the snake on the ground is around yet. Because many, many times 
you never see a snake before he bites you. Eh? If you happen to see a snake and it's coming your direction, what will you do? Abba, you first run before you see what to do to it. Most of the time, the snake that bites a man, you may never know. You may never see it until it has done. But you know, the strategy is simple. Whether you see the snake biting or not. You see, some people now decided in Israel to do what? To keep looking up permanently. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And as if as soon as you keep looking up, you paralyze. Are you hearing me? You make void. You make empty the venom of the snake on the ground. I don't know whether you understand what I've said so far. Are you with me? God will help us. And as if once you looked up and you are focusing on the serpent on the tree, the power of the serpent on the ground is nullified. That's a strategy. A strategy that looks so difficult for human beings to comprehend. Now, have you got that strategy? Alright. We will not have been talking about it. Or rather, we will have talked about it as one of the miracles of the Bible. But because the Lord Jesus, in John chapter 3, in response to the question of Nicodemus, how can these things be? Now Jesus now refer back to that story and say, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, and the word even so, makes it much more serious for us. In the same way, in the same manner, exactly like that, must the Son of Man be what? Be lifted up. Alright? You are with me to that point. But the question before we begin to tie it together, why must it be another serpent that is being hung on the tree? Why must it be another serpent? Why must you represent the same serpent on the cross? What is the need? And Jesus Christ came. We know him to be the son of the living God. Isn't it? We know him to be righteous. How dear, how, why should he identify himself as the brazen serpent that must be put on the tree? We all know that serpent, if it does not stand for the devil, it stands for something bad. Abi, it stands for something wicked. It stands for something terrible. How can Jesus Christ identify himself and say, just as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness by Moses, so also, even so, shall the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever shall believe on him shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Why must it be a serpent that is being represented over there? I think that's a big question that me and you need to explore tonight. May God help us in the name of Jesus Christ. Alright, are you with me? Can we do that exploration a bit? And wherever we can stop, we'll go ahead. Now, I told you that what brought the serpent to bite men was what? was the matter of sin. You know as many people as that serpent bite, what happened to them? They died. Because the wages of sin is what? Is death. And if you read the Bible, I think First Corinthians 15, 
the Holy Spirit was beginning to give us an understanding. He said, The power. He said, The wages of sin is death. He now talked about the sting. What did he call the sting of sin? Is it the sting of sin or the sting of death? Let's turn to it. Let's look at it. First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 15. Are you there already? Yes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Can you read verse 20, I mean 55 and 56 for us? O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is your victory? Aha! What did the Bible say that? The sting of death is sin. Alright, thank you. Let's stop there. Can someone read it from another version? Either NIV or Good News or Living Bible. What are you reading, sir? NIV, yes? Death, where is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. That's NIV. Where is good news? Where is good news? Eh? Where is your victory, Mr. Death? Yes. Yes. Are you hearing that? Death gets its power. To do what? To hurt from sin. Yes. Alright. Thank you very much. God bless you. What are we discovering there? What gives death is sting. Eh? Now, where there is no sin, what happens to death? Eh? There's nothing. It cannot bite. It means as if death, even though death, it cannot kill when there is no sin to give it a sting. Are you with me, small, small? God will help us. And I know that He will. We are going little by little, but the Holy Ghost is here to help us. Now, the Bible said, the sting of death is sin. What is giving the serpent? What makes the serpent serpent? Can I ask you? What makes a snake very dangerous? Eh? Is the venom? Is the poison inside it? Is the sting? Supposing it is possible to catch a snake and use syringe to siphon out, to draw out all the venom inside that snake, and he did not die, what will that snake become? Eh? It becomes powerless. It becomes a toy. Ah? You can carry it anyway. It is useless. Thank you. Hallelujah. It can do nothing again. It can try to bite you. But as it's biting you, it's as if it's only helping you to scratch your leg. Why? Why? The sting had been withdrawn. Are you with me, small, small? Alright. Now, the Bible says what they put on the cross is the brassing serpent. 
and see the inside. What makes the serpent on the ground re serpent? They take it out and did what? Put it on the tree. And as if as soon as a serpent on the ground bites, and you have enough faith to look up and say, Look, it loses its power. The sting is gone. It becomes empty. It becomes impotent. It becomes ineffective. Now, can I ask you now, what is what makes death actually powerful? From what we have read, sin. The sting of death, the Bible says, is sin. All right. Are you with me? Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up and put on the cross. What is it that we put Jesus on the cross as a way out of the matter that is making it impossible for us to be victorious? Are you hearing what I'm talking about? So the Bible says, and I want us to see the strategy of God is a strategy. God decided, and I'm praying that you will understand. He decided not to chase about all the serpents that is in this world. God decided not to chase out all the demons everywhere and say, Oh, you demon, why are you troubling my children? Get away, get away. No. He decided not to do that. God decided not to even deal with the serpent that is biting our lives every day. But he decided to provide a means of rendering the, the power of darkness, the power of the devil, and the power of death to render it how impotent. Do you hear what I'm saying? At the cross, where Jesus Christ stepped in to stand there for us, the power of the devil, the sting of death, was what? Was siphoned and made empty. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now listen. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians 5. Let's go gradually there. And see what God will help us to accomplish. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want someone to please stand and read verse 14 for us, verse 15, and then verse 21 with a good voice. Yes, sir. Verse 14. 14. For the love of Christ constrained us. Yes, verse 21. He has made him. Made who? Eh? He has made Jesus to be what? To be seen. Even though he knew no sin.
so that we might become we may be made the righteousness of God in him when God instructed Moses to make another serpent and hang it there as if God was saying there's a strategy I'm going to introduce and please let's run over this quickly before we can tie it tonight and go back when God decided to step into the situation of man it was the cross he planned about it was at the cross the power of sin was what was broken It was at the cross that the sting of death, which is sin, was put. It was at the cross that God decided to render impotent and render useless all the power that sin had given the devil over your lives. You are not understanding what I'm saying. There's something sin has done to us. Sin has robbed us of power and transferred it into the hand of the devil. If the devil is biting any of you today, do you know what gave him that power? It was the problem of sin. If the devil is afflicting you with sickness today, what could have given him that authority? It was sin. If the devil can walk into your house today and scatter it, it was sin. And God decided he was not going to run around the devil. <laughs> Hallelujah. He was not going to be chasing all the demons. There are too many to be chased. But he was going to withdraw their thing. He was going to break their power by constructing a divine strategy. That strategy, when Jesus Christ went on the cross of Calvary, he bore. What did he bore? He bore our sin. What gave the devil authority? What gave death the power? What gave all the oppressors that oppressed us their thing? He withdrew it and put it on the Lord Jesus and he went on the cross. I'm not asking you to conclude yet. I want you to follow me still, just little by little. Are you with me? All right. Let's move on very quickly. And check some other scriptures until the Lord has helped us. We are going steadily. Turn your Bibles to the book of Colossians. We're in the book of Colossians. We are going to read Colossians chapter 2. Are you already there? Okay. We are going to look at from verse 11 verse 12 13 but then we are going to put serious emphasis on verse 14 and verse 15. So I want someone to read if you have King James, you read from 11 to 15. Then we start checking all the other versions that are available. Who is reading for me? Colossians 
chapter 2 from verse 11. Alright, sir. Okay, this man is standing up now. Yes, sir. You must read in a manner that men here will hear you. Alright. Alright. Praise the Lord. You see the word of God introducing another terminology. What is that terminology? Circumcision. Whereas, in the days of Abraham, circumcision was a physical cutting of the of the flesh of the first king. The Jews used to talk about it. But it was a symbol, it was a strategy. What was that symbol talking about? The cross. Don't worry, you will be all right. The Holy Ghost is going to help us. Certain things that have hindered your life from being what God wants it to be, which we call in the morning the flesh. Even when you have decided, I will not do this thing again, I will not do it again. When Mr. Flesh jumps up within you, what did you discover? You find yourself doing what you say you will not do again. But what is God's way of dealing with that thing so that the devil doesn't continue to have power over our lives? Is to cut it off. The cutting off of the flesh is what they call circumcision. And the Bible is talking about it here now in verse 11. Can you repeat it? As we are going on, verse 11. Let's join him together. 11, sir. There is a circumcision made without hands. And we get that kind of circumcision in Christ Jesus. Yes. Are you hearing that? Go on. Go ahead, brother, quickly. Yes. And you be dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh as he preaches together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Yes, sir. Cutting out the unrighteousness of ordinances that were against God. Please, let's note that. Blotting out all the unrighteousness of ordinances that was against us. Which was contrary to us. Contrary to us. And took it out of the way. He took it out of the way. All right, go ahead. And having spoiled principalities and powers, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made, he made a shoe of them properly. Yes. Triumphing over them. All right, thank you very much. Thank God. Amen. Now let's look at that verse 14 and verse 15 from other versions, as many as we can get. Where is good news? Who carried good news the other time? Alright, sir. Good news. Oh, you are not you are not reading to the congregation. He cancelled the unfavorable record of our debts with his binding rules. Yeah. Alright. On that cross. On that cross, listen, Christ freed himself from the power of the spiritual rulers and authorities. Yes. He made a public spectacle of them. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Did you follow something to that point? What did you get? He said, 
there were unfavorable record with his binding rules that the devil has kept and every time he comes to oppress your life he says this is the reason whosoever breaketh an edge it is my right to do what? to bite him and as long as those records are standing he has an unlimited unchallengeable right to do what? to bite Let's go ahead. Can we read that from Living Bible? Verse 14. He blotted out the charges proved against you. I don't know whether you understand this. Wait, wait brother, wait brother. Thank you, you are going to read again. Keep standing, are you tired? I thought you want to be a preacher. Brother, just wait a bit. Keep standing there. Now, what do we say? As if the Bible said, somebody is keeping a list. What is in that list? Go ahead and read again from verse 14. All charges proved against you. The list of God's commandments that you have not obeyed. Wait, 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 wait. Are you understand what I'm talking about? Every time you broke one commandment, one instruction from the word of God, somebody is keeping the record. Who is that? The devil is keeping the record. And it's a list with dates, time, and location where you disobeyed. Why did you need that list? Eh? You know that sin is the sting of death. Sin is the thing that gives death its power. It's the thing that the devil rides upon to bring all his confusion, all his attack, all his biting on the life of a man. So he is very, 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 very alert, catching every disobedience. And you wonder why the devil keeps tempting men and luring them to sin. You know why? He's looking for some charges. He's the one that arranges temptation. Is the one that pushes you inside. And as soon as you jump inside, he will quickly put it on record. He said, he has fallen this time. We have caught him this time. You know he did this now. He did that now. Anytime your name came up in heaven for promotion, for a blessing. Did you remember the Bible said, the accuser of our brethren. Who accused them once a month? He accused them once a week. When does he accuse them? Day and night. 24 hours. Anytime a blessing is coming on your way and they are considering you for something good, the devil will quickly, quickly come with his list and say, Thou Father, you are righteous and you are not a respecter of persons. And I do know that you are a God of holiness. And that you have a purer eyes. Your eyes cannot behold iniquity. I wish to bring to your remembrance. That this man that you are trying now to promote and carry. G -g 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 as if he is somebody. He had not actually obeyed you. And here is a list. November 14, 1993 when he traveled on a government assignment I know you never forget that November 14, 1993 when he left home 
you remember what he did with a strange lady he met. The record is being kept. In case you forget, it's here, sir. And by January 1995, there were some certain monies that were passed into his hand, which he was supposed to retire. That money was just about 10,000 naira, and he was supposed to have returned about 4,000. But he made it up, and everything finished. In case you cannot remember, that thing actually happened January 10, 1995. Here is the record. That's why the other version calls it unfavorable record. That record never favors you. That record never records any good thing you did. The devil is not interested in any good thing you did. He does not keep the record and the list of all the obediences you have obeyed. What interests him all the time is those charges that gives him a thing to bite your life. Are you with me, brother? And every time the glory of God is about to come, they say, Sorry, sir. Will you still glorify a sinner? And when you begin to promote a sinner like this man, it means you have no right to punish me anymore. What drove me out of my position was sin. And I don't understand why another sinner will be occupying his own position while I have been driven out. That old God who does not respect persons and there is no magumago with you, please reconsider the case. <laughs> and he does that not once a week old. He does it every day. Day and night. Those of you that are playing around with sin, you don't understand what you are doing. Even when God wanted to bless you, the devil is standing there and saying, No, sir. You remember one man called Joshua in the book of the, um, is it, uh, is it Zechariah? That priest that the Bible said was about to make an offering. He already got to the very presence of God. The Bible says Satan stood where by his right hand and held him. Each time he wanted to say praise the Lord, the devil said for where? He pulled down his hand to resist him. And then the Lord was saying, what do you mean? Satan, get away. He said, no sir, look at his dress. Look at how he is. I cannot imagine that this kind of man will be allowed in your presence. And you know that man couldn't do anything until they changed that garment. Are you hearing me? Okay. Now there is a list that is being kept. That list, somebody is interested in it, the devil. There are some of you that each time we pray for you because you are barren, that you should have a baby. The devil bring out a list. Say, Father, you remember that this girl is a murderer. In 1984, when she was in form 3, the first blessing of the womb that she should have had. Do you remember what she did to it? She flushed it out. And 1986, she did it again. And by 1989, you know, she almost died when she went into another series of abortion. And you know, she never confessed to this husband she married that she had aborted before. Will you still please, Lord, bless a liar and a murderer? And you will still be the righteous God. Ah! Unfortunately, whatever blessing was coming, postponed. Some people's blessings are postponed because the enemy 
has a list. And that list was the weapon the devil uses every day to bite. But we thank God for a divine strategy. A strategy that if the devil had known that that's what God was going to do, he would not have allowed Jesus, he would not have crucified him. It was a mistake. Brother, read now for us, verse 14. He blotted out the charges proved against you, the list of his commandments which you have not obeyed. Hallelujah! What again happened on the cross? That list. That list. Which actually was the power. The sting. Of the principalities and power. He took it. And what did he do to it? He nailed it. To the cross. When we talk of the cross. Whereas some people first think that the cross meant suffering. No. I will be explaining to you in the course of this meeting how the cross can become a suffering. But primarily speaking, the cross is the place of our deliverance. The cross is the highest point that broke the powers of darkness on our behalf. You remember it was at the cross that the veil of the temple was broken into pieces. Do you remember that? It was at the cross. It was at the cross that Jesus Christ announced. What did he say? It is finished. It is all over. The tyranny of sin, the tyranny of Satan, and the power of death, it is finished. It was at the cross. Now let's read it. Brother, you have not finished. In, in this way, are you hearing that? In this way, brother, you are moving too fast. Start again in verse 15. In this way, start again, brother. In this way, let me be helping you. In this way, God took away the power of Satan to accuse you of sin. Hallelujah. Okay. Let me pick that scripture from another version. Let me pick it from Philip's English. Philip's modern English. I'll read it from verse 14. He has utterly wiped out the written evidence of broken commandments which always hung over our heads and has completely annulled it by nailing it to the cross. And then, having drawn the sting of all the powers and authorities ranged against us, he exposed them shattered, empty, and defeated in his own triumphant victory at the cross. Do you understand what we have read? Do you understand what we have read? Let me read it again. He wiped out all the written evidence of broken commandments. You know something used to happen in Nigeria some years ago? When people have embezzled government money and they are being asked to go and face a pro panel, what suddenly happened to the office? The whole house is burnt. Imagine that cocoa house Eh? of the former western state uh, tradition what happened to the whole of that place burnt down because some people are being queried 
of mismanagement. They know that once the record are wiped out, there is no court that can try the case because there will be no evidence. <laughs> Hallelujah. At the cross, all written evidence about my sin, all written evidence about my disobedience, all written evidence about all commandments I have broken were what? Wiped out. I pray the Holy Ghost will help you to see something tonight. That even if the devil were to want to stand up to accuse you or to bite you, he has no sting again. And he can go all over the world looking for a record. It's wiped out. Amen. The cross of Jesus wiped it out. And the Bible now said, he wiped out completely the written evidence of broken commandment which always hung over our heads. If I can describe that thing, it will be, it will be interesting. That every one of you as you are going up and down on the road, until you come to the cross, there is a certificate hanging on your neck. What is that certificate? Certificate of debt. That gives the devil a warrant of a warrant, a warrant to strike you and to push you down. Everywhere you are going, all over around your head, written evidence. It's very painful for you to discover that every sinner that is in this meeting, every man that has neglected the cross, wherever you go, whether you dress up with your suit in the office, or you are traveling in your car, there is something hanging over your head. It is all the written evidence of God's commandment that you are broken, for which the devil will not allow you to sleep. Some people say, I don't know why I cannot sleep in the night. I know why. There's a warrant in the hand of the devil that gives him an unlimited I mean, right to break through into your life any day, any time, and do whatever he likes. But we thank God for the divine strategy of the cross. Hallelujah. Amen. The cross. At the cross, that certificate was wiped out. At the cross, look at the Bible. Let me read it again from that Philip's mother English. And he has completely annulled it. He has completely discarded it. Hallelujah. He has completely cancelled it by nailing it to the cross. And then having withdrawn the sting of all the powers and authorities ranged against us. I don't know whether you understand what I'm talking about now. It's as if by the cross, the Lord decided to put a syringe. And what did he do? He siphoned out all the sting, all the powers of the principalities, of the authorities, of the Demons that were arranged against your life, they were withdrawn. Whereas God did not tell the devil not to bite. But the truth now is that those of us that have come to the cross, those of us that have looked unto the man of Calvary at the cross, the truth is that the devil can bite, but he can do us no harm. The truth is that he can go everywhere. We can even put our leg and say, yeah, bite, if you like. The serpent that normally killed, it becomes a toy at the cross. At the cross, the authorities of hell were withdrawn. Their thing was taken out. And the Bible said, he exposed them openly publicly as shattered 
empty, defeated, and impotent. Are you with me to that point? Alright. So at the cross, a divine mystery took place. To those that are perishing, when we talk of the cross, it looks like foolish. To a man who is being saved, it is the greatest power of God. It's at the cross that the power of sin, we gave death his thing, was terminated. But let me stop at this point. I think we can go beyond here so that we can close again on time tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The question I want to put before you as I stop. I'm not going beyond here. There are other symbols of the cross in the scriptures that we are going to study. But I think we can't do that tonight. We'll do it eventually tomorrow. But the first question, the serpent that was hung on the tree for the children of Israel, let me ask you a question. For whom does it work? Eh? Those who look to it. Look. Look at this thing as it is being hanged here. Since when was this thing put? Where are the decorating sisters? Since when did you put this thing here? Since, since Saturday. All right. Since youth week. <laughs> Praise the Lord. One young man says it's long. That is since youth week. Is it true? Okay, somehow. Don't worry. Now, but the question is this. You know it makes no meaning. In fact, some of you may have been passing not knowing it is there. Until I started pointing at it. Eh? You know, some of you didn't even know that there's anything here. Until I started pointing at it. The cross, the serpent that was put on the tree, had been there. Maybe some person had about 10 people in their family when the serpent started biting. He buy the first man. He said, yeah, 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 yeah. My father, my father, my father. What happened to that one? That. The serpent bites the second man in the same family. Oh, my God. It, it has happened again. No. Oh, it has come again. No. Oh. What happened to that one also? He died. Number third, number three. The thing happened. I say, oh, hey, what shall we do now? Kai, yeah, you, ah, kai, 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 kai. What happened to that one also? He died. Excuse me, why were they dying? Is it because the serpent on the tree was not there? Eh? They did not look up. <clears throat> Imagine that when number eight was beaten by the serpent. Somebody said, don't look down. Look up! He said to look up for what? To look up for what? I said, this thing is here. This way is biting me by saying, look up. Yeah! Yeah! And he did not look up. What happened to that number eight? He died. And then they said, why is it my family alone? That like this thing just want to finish us. Then somebody said, no. You should not have died. You shouldn't have lost all those eight people. It's because the means of healing is not by holding the leg. It's not by crying. It's by looking up. If it happens to bite you again, look up. Do you know what the man now decided? He said, I will not even allow it to bite me before I start looking up. So what did he decide to do now? He started looking up permanently. Hallelujah. 